Hey, well, good afternoon. I'm so glad to see all of you guys today. And I'm sorry again as we're running a little bit later, uh, different times, and so trying to uh, go ahead and get my family schedule situated and take care of all of them. Uh, hi to Daniela. So glad to see you. I'm glad that uh, others are going to be able to join us as we kind of go ahead and talk a little bit about our next uh, material for today. Our material for today, there is a handout called Opium, Asia, and Banana Republics. Opium, Asia, and Banana Republics. That's what we're going ahead and looking at this afternoon. And we're really in the last few lessons. I think we have really just uh, today's lesson and two more lessons next week. Uh, and then we're done with our material in total, which is great and exciting as the AP World History Test is next week, and we want to do all we can to prepare for that. Uh, so if you are uh, looking, we're going to be talking about, again, this relationship between imperialism and economics because they do come together significantly. So that's what we're looking at today, this relationship between economics and imperialism. And some of this is going to be really review. Some of this is going to be material that we've covered before. And others of it, it might be some material that is uh, a bit new. And that's okay. So let's go ahead and look at some general trends. It says, for most of world history, India was the world's leading producer of, we'll write down, finished cotton. Finished cotton. So for most of world history, uh, India was like a major producer, you know, is where they grew cotton, they made it into textiles. India made a lot of money in this area. Good to see you, Noah. Noah is joining us just a little bit late. Good afternoon, Noah. And so that's what India did. You know, India was this home, this source of great wealth. You know, they had access to spices and to textiles, but all that would begin to change. In fact, in the 19th century, Britain would take the lead in textile production. And there's a reason for that. In fact, this is something that all of us should know by this time. By this time, all of us should know that the reason why countries like India were falling behind and countries like Great Britain were surging ahead is because Western Europe and the United States went through something that changed their economies forever. And that was, you'll write down, the Industrial Revolution. They went through the Industrial Revolution. And as a result of going through the Industrial Revolution, we see mass production happening. With mass production, we see that textile, which is another word for cloth material, actually became very cheap and put skilled Indian artisans out of business. An artisan is someone who has a skill. And when you have a choice between having something made by machine, when you have something made by machine that's so quick and so cheap, or you're going to pay a skilled artisan to do that same job for more, I mean, it just doesn't make economic sense. And so these people who were once very important and vital in this global economy, well, they are one of the losers economically here in the 19th century. Good to see Austin joining us. Well, it says on the handout that due to uh, mass production, textiles became cheap. This put Indian skilled artisans out of business. And by the end of the 19th century, India was only supplying raw cotton. They were only supplying raw cotton. So this is a huge change, right? This is a change that happens over time. You know, they were the the producer of finished textiles. They were making a lot of money through that. But now they are really just the source of the raw material. This is a change that happens over time. It says that Britain now began selling finished cotton to India. And so here's even this role reversal that we talked a little bit about the other day, that not only are European countries looking to their colonies as a source of raw materials, but they're also looking to their colonies as potential markets. 
So the very thing that India grew and made and sold to England is now being still grown in India, but now it's being made in factories for cheap in in Europe, in London, in in Manchester, these places in, in Great Britain, and now being sold to India. So there's a change that has happened here, a bit of a role reversal. It says that this became a great uh, a source of wealth for Britain. In fact, the 1800s, we see this growing power and influence that the British have as they expand in the global economy. And there's yet another thing that we'll see that contributes further to the wealth of Great Britain. Even more wealth would come from another crop. And this is a crop we've talked about before, a crop that's highly addictive, a crop that the British are going to use as their their way to get into the Chinese market. Hopefully you've guessed it by now. That crop is opium. And there's pictures of opium on our handout. Actually, this is still a problem today. We have uh, opiates to this day. We have these these highly addictive drugs that we have to this day. And here in the picture of our handouts, we have these poppy fields. And it's kind of interesting that we have these poppy fields here uh, in Afghanistan is one of the leading producers of uh, poppies today that are used in the manufacture of these opiates, these illegal opiates, things including heroin. And if you think about like a childhood, a famous childhood uh, movie, The Wizard of Oz, there's this scene in The Wizard of Oz where they're going through poppy fields. And when they go through these poppy fields, they They fall asleep and they wake up to this dreamlike experience where there's like, you know, little people singing and dancing. There's horses painted pink and purple. It's this wonderful Wizard of Oz scenario. It's after they go through this poppy field. And so that's kind of like a drug reference there in the Wizard of Oz. And this is definitely going to be making money for the British as they push this hallucinogenic uh, influencing drug on the Chinese. It says on the handout the drug was highly addictive and it was grown in India. It turned out that India was perfect for growing opium. They took it from India, modern day parts of modern day Pakistan, and they sold it to China to make profit. It says uh, it was sold to China. And so this is one of the strategies that the uh, Europeans do have as they are extending, uh, they are extending their influence globally. They're extending their influence globally. So it says on the handout below that, that we now need to look at the rise of economic imperialism. We need to look at the rise of economic imperialism. In the 1800s, it says that global power began to move away from Asia. And that's the big change, you know, that's a huge change over time, you know, forever and ever and ever, Asia was where wealth and power and influence was, you know, when the Europeans first showed up on India's doorsteps with like goods to trade, like the Indians literally laughed at what the Europeans brought. When Marco Polo went and lived in China and he wrote a book saying, hey, this is what it's like in China. Europeans didn't even believe like how advanced China was. They thought he was like full on making it up. And it turns out he didn't make it up. He was reliable, reliably reporting many elements of what it was like to be in China. And so China and India for so long were so advanced above Europe. I mean, Europe didn't have spices. Europe didn't have any goods. I mean, what did the Indians or the Chinese really want from Europe? Nothing, not a lot. And so there's a huge change that happens here in the 1900s. In the 1800s, global power began to move away from Asia, and power began to move to the industrialized world. Power began to move to the industrialized world. And that's, like, that's a new thing. You know, The countries that had, were going through an industrial revolution, those were the countries who were really becoming the winners. And the countries that refuse to modernize are really becoming the losers. There's two Asian countries that make two very different decisions. There's a country who says, we're not going to modernize. We're going to stay true to our own culture. You know, things that are new are not good. We're going to double down and we're just going to stay true to what we know to be true. All of the cultures are trash. Other cultures are barbarians. And 
that Asian country that makes that decision is China. And we know that that's a disastrous decision for China. On the other end, there's another country who says, listen, um, refusing to modernize just got China beat up. Refusing to modernize has allowed Europeans and to a lesser extent Americans to come in and just do whatever they want. And the Asian country that realized to succeed in the 19th century means modernization, it means industrialization, that country was Japan. So these two countries, China on one hand, Japan on the other, they take two very different paths. One to success uh, in Japan and one to failure in China. It says on your handout that uh, power began to move to the industrialized world. Leaders included Great Britain, the United States, and two newcomers. One country, one's a newcomer that we just, just mentioned a few moments ago, Japan, Japan's newcomer. In fact, they're going to modernize so well that they're going to do exactly what white European countries did. What did the British do really well? They beat up people and had an empire. What did the French do? Pretty well. Uh, not really well, but pretty well. They beat up people and they had an empire. And what did the Japanese ultimately decide to do? They decide to beat up their neighbors and have an empire. That empire hits its peak in World War II when they even attack part of the United States. Famously, you know, uh, Pearl Harbor, right? The Japanese want to expand their empire. And in their mind, they think taking, taking Hawaii is a very real possibility in their mind. It says on the handout that, uh, and the other a newcomer will write down is Germany. Remember, Germany wasn't even a country in for most of the 1800s. At the end, of, in the the end of the 1800s, German-speaking states kind of like unified together, and they decided similarly that they want to be like the other European countries, and that means they want it. They want an empire. So Germany and Japan, and also no surprise, guess who becomes friends in the middle in in World War II. Those two countries that are late to imperialism, but do really well. I mean, they, they join imperialism late, but they do really well compared to like their neighbors. I mean, we also know the story of, of Nazi Germany's growth and their power. It says on the handout, economic imperialism, which is like this, this theme that we've been talking about, economic imperialism. This is when foreign business interests have great economic power and influence. This is when foreign business interests have great economic power and influence. And so when we have these countries like the British and the Americans, economic imperialism, sometimes it is them full on directly controlling Africa, full on controlling Indonesia. But sometimes it's not direct control, it's indirect control. Like the United States never like directly controlled Central America. But we had a lot of influence, a lot of interest in messing with their politics to make sure that the leaders who were there supported what we, the United States, wanted to do. And so we call this whole theme economic imperialism. And this is actually one of the bad things that happens with capitalism. Capitalism definitely is imperfect. Um, and this is one of the imperfect results that we see from capitalism. It says that businesses look to extend their influence beyond their borders. They wanted to expand, extend their influence beyond their borders. So it's not enough that corporations in the United States want to stay in the United States. Listen, if you are a fruit company, if you grow fruit, if you are Dole, if you are the United Fruit Company, if you are any of these companies, you are looking to Latin America. You're looking to Hawaii as a place where if you can get the United States government to kind of like push around and like intimidate those local governments, you can end up with some really amazing deals that benefit you at the expense of these growing companies. So these companies want to extend beyond their borders. Well, let's go ahead and look, first of all, at Asia as an example. There was a shift in power in what Europeans are going to be involved in Asia happening after 1588 and up to this point the leading european power had been spain you know 1492 chris sails the ocean blue and spain which was like newly unified you might remember like spain had been controlled by muslims since the year 711 part 
of Spain had been ruled by Muslims, so they finally kicked out the last Muslims in 1492 in this process called the Reconquista, when they were reconquering Spain from Muslims. And one of the first things they did is they financed Chris Columbus to sail west, thinking that he was going to be able to get to Asia to find a quicker route to access spices and Asian products. But instead, he found the Americas, north and south. He didn't even know that that was a thing. He died thinking he was in Asia still somewhere, which is why Native Americans were erroneously called Indians. But Spain gets a lot of money from that. You know, they conquer the Aztecs, they conquer the Inca, tons of gold, tons of silver. Spain goes from economically a nobody to one of the richest countries on the planet. Bummer for Spain. They kicked out some of the most influential, wise financial advisors that they could have had. They kicked out the Muslims and they kicked out all the Jews from Spain. And they made some disastrous economic decisions um, and military decisions as well. Overspending and expensive wars helped lead to Spain's decline. It helped lead to Spain's decline. And one of the big military mistakes was that the Spanish decided, you know what we're going to do to England? We're going to invade England. There was a woman on the throne of England at the time, Queen Elizabeth I. Problems with her, she's number one, she's not a Catholic, and she's a woman. And the King of Spain had some confrontational problems with her and said, look, we'll invade Spain. We know God is for the Catholic Church. How could we, the Catholic nation of Spain, lose against a Protestant like Queen Elizabeth, who, by the way, is a woman? 1588, England success, successfully defended themselves from invasion and defeated something that was called the Spanish Armada. Uh, the Spanish Armada was, at the time, like considered this like powerful, overwhelmingly tough invading force. There's a really good movie called uh, Elizabeth, the Golden Age, starring Kate Blanchett, I believe, who plays Queen Elizabeth. And it's all about the, the English trying to defend themselves from the Spanish Armada. And they do. It's, it's considered miraculous by the, the, the English. They believe that this is divine intervention. And, uh, you know, England is protected from being invaded. And as a result of Spain kind of being on the decline, the result is that the Asian spice trade is now going to be open up to the British and the Dutch. And so it used to be that the Spanish and the Portuguese were like the two countries that were like in Asia, dominating, making deals, making trade. You might remember that there's a whole series of islands controlled by Spain all the way to the end of the 1800s. That's the Philippines. So the, the Portuguese and the Dutch, uh, the Portuguese and the Spanish were like those first Europeans that were actively involved in Asia. But after this, we're going to see the, Por the Portuguese and the Spanish kind of fading away and the English, the British and the Dutch kind of being on the rise in influence. It says that trade was initially led by a company called the British East India Company. The British East India Company. We talked about and mentioned the British, the British East India Company before. They are going to dominate particularly in India proper and later on they're going to transition from like the company, the British East India Company, kind of like ruling, managing India to like the British directly controlling India, something called the British Raj, which we've talked about before. And not only the British, but also the VOC, which is the acronym of what stands for the Dutch East India Company. That's what the VOC stands for the Dutch East India Company. We've talked about the VOC before. And, and there's this famous image depicting the Dutch, you know, as this woman, the Dutch Empire is this woman and she's holding this necklace and this necklace, you know, you might have like a necklace with various parts or charms, whatever the case may be. And this necklace has this series of islands representing what's modern day Indonesia. And this is supposed to be like representative of that. The Dutch are growing in power and influence and just like a woman might wear a necklace to show off her wealth and power. The Dutch were showing off the fact that they controlled these, these spice islands. In fact, this region that the Dutch come into control is modern day Indonesia. Modern day Indonesia. This is south of Vietnam, south of Thailand. You have an image, a map of where Indonesia is, this massive nation. And, and Indonesia, it was the source of what was then called the Spice Islands. 
because guess what grew in these islands that Europeans wanted? They wanted spice. I mean, just imagine how different European diet was. There was no pepper, there's no cinnamon, there's no no spices at all. It's like you have salt, you know, like that's what you have. And so the Spice Islands is what it was called. In 1799, control went from the VOC uh, and indirect rule. Uh, that's the kind of rule that the VOC had. They had indirect rule. What I mean by that is that it wasn't like the official Dutch government was ruling directly. It was this Dutch corporation kind of like representing the Dutch and it was an indirect rule and it moved to eventually the Dutch government taking direct rule. So same thing happened with the British, the British company, the British East India Company kind of ran India and then eventually uh, the British government full on takes over. It would be like if there was a country, you know, in, in Asia that Apple decided to move production to or decide, let, let's say that they move production to some Asian country and uh, Apple said, you know what, uh, we're, and, and the president of this Asian country was like giving Apple deals and stuff like that. And Apple said, you know what, it'd be easier than making deals. Let's just overthrow the government and take over. And they called the president of the United States to invade this country. Um, that's kind of what happened here. It went from a corporation influencing and running to actually the direct Dutch government. This political cartoon of this woman holding this necklace has a caption and the caption reads, making a reference to Indonesia, all these islands, it reads, our most precious jewel, our most precious jewel. So just like a woman would have these jewels adorning her neck, Indonesia was the most precious jewel that the Dutch empire had. And the Dutch, what did they do with the people that they conquered? Well, they did a couple of things. Number one, they forced them to make a choice where they would either have to, number one, farm cash crops. We've talked about cash crops before. This could be coffee. This could be sugar. This could be palm oil. And the Dutch show up to these islands and say, hey, guys, uh, you have a choice. You can either uh, farm cash crops or, number two, you can work on government farms unpaid for 66 days a year. You can work on government farms unpaid for 66 days a year. And that's a tough choice, you know, because if you are growing cash crops, you know what you're not growing for your family, for your community, for your country? You're not growing food anymore. And if I do decide to be a laborer for 66 days, I don't know if I want to work 66 days without pay to enrich these foreign conquerors. That's a hard choice. It says uh, there's a... a social change that happens to the Dutch introduce a caste system. And the very top of this caste system, it's a pyramid caste system. Guess who's on the top of this caste system? White Europeans are on the top of the caste system. The Dutch East Indies ruled by, uh, by a Dutch presence. And, and how, what kind of percent was the Dutch in this society in Indonesia? We'll write down that it was only 0.4% of the population. Only 0.4% of the population were these white people in charge. And then the pyramid goes down. They actually put other Asians ahead of the native people of Indonesia. They put Chinese people ahead of them. They put Japanese people ahead of them. And they kind of treated those native Indonesian people like trash. In fact, native Indonesians were at the bottom of society in their own country. They're in the bottom of society in their own country. And this practice, uh, I think I skipped on this practice of, of giving these um, um, Indonesians a choice between either growing cash crops or, um, or um, working unpaid, that practice came to an end in 1870, but they just found other ways to abuse these native peoples. And so the Dutch introduced this caste system. The very top of the pyramid was this small minority, white minority, 0.4% of the population. That might remind you of another example of a white minority ruling a non-white majority in South Africa. You might remember there's a word for that. That word is called apartheid. And there's this guy named Cecil Rhodes who himself didn't start it formally, but laid the foundation for that. And uh, it says even after 300 years of Dutch 
influence, very few came to speak Dutch. In fact, only 2% of the population in Indonesia would learn to speak Dutch. And that's really different than like, say, the Spanish. You know, what did, uh, what did the Spanish do? Um, well, the Spanish changed Latin America forever, you know? The Spanish, they made a huge difference, you know? Spanish became the language of Mexico, of all South America. What did the British do? The British brought English to Uganda and Kenya and in South Africa and other places, but the Dutch don't really do so well uh, in spreading their culture. Indonesia earned their independence in 1949. They earned their independence in 1949. Um, and again, you know, why did they earn their independence in 49? They earned it because after World War II, how awkward is it to say, man, we were like totally against Adolf Hitler uh, because he invaded people against their, their desire. We were against the Japanese because they invaded people. Well, what did the Dutch do? 1949, they get their independence. And for many years, um, the China had goods in great demand in Britain, like tea. You know, that was like one of the things, uh, that was one of the things that the Chinese had that the British wanted. And because it was something that the British wanted, they bought it. And the problem is there was nothing the British made that the Chinese wanted as well. This created a trade imbalance. It created a trade imbalance, you know, the British were buying a bunch of Chinese tea, and there was nothing that the Chinese wanted to buy from the British. The Chinese were not interested in British goods. And so if the Chinese aren't interested in British goods, we need to find a solution to this. What's the solution to the fact that the Chinese um, um, want to ignore the British? Well. To make up for these losses, the British introduced opium. And there's a chart that kind of shows you the astronomical growth of opium consumption in China. And there's a photograph showing you these guys smoking opium. This was a huge problem because it turns out that this drug is highly addictive. This drug is highly addictive. You know, it's something that you use even if it destroys your life. And this is what makes it such a great product for the British to push. They become these early drug pushers. And China doesn't want this. China doesn't want to accept it. In fact, it says that the Chinese made it illegal, leading to conflict with Britain. And this conflict was called the Opium War. We've talked about the Opium War before. The British were trying to push opium. The Chinese said, no, I don't. This is just literally destroying our country. And the British said, listen, you making my drugs illegal is actually you declaring war on me. And so the British invade and the British destroyed the Chinese. In fact, this was an easy victory for Great Britain. This was a really easy victory for Great Britain. This is an example of failed native resistance. This is an example of failed native resistance. The people of China, the government of China, didn't want the British pushing opium on them. The people of China, the government of China, didn't want the British making profits off of them. And so the Chinese government said no. They made it illegal. They started destroying opium. And as a result, the, China, the British, which had industrialized, they had a better army, they invaded, and they just like wiped out any Chinese opposition. This is an example of failed native resistance. They tried to resist, and it actually ended up worse for them as a result. This is an example of how easily Western powers could dominate non-industrialized nations. This is an example of how easily powers could dominate, Western powers could dominate non-industrialized nations. There's a divide. Countries that are industrialized, they're going to do well. They're going to conquer. They're going to have colonies. And then non-industrialized nations, they're going to get beat up. They're going to be taken advantage of. They're going to be 
colonized. China did not understand the global shift in power in favor of industrialized nations. They did not understand that there was going to be a global shift in power in favor of industrialized nations. They thought it's going to be okay just how it is. They're going to say everything's fine. They're going to say we don't have to industrialize, and that was a mistake. One of the treaties that ended this war was the Treaty of Nanking, and this actually forced China to open up to trade. That's something they didn't want. The Chinese had actually been limited to just one city uh, called Canton. Uh, they had told the Europeans, you can't go anywhere but Canton. This actually opens them up to trade. Britain even got a piece of territory out of the Opium War. They got the island of Hong Kong. They got the island of Hong Kong. And they actually even held on to the island of Hong Kong all the way until 1997. They held on to 1997. And, you know, that has a huge influence. In fact, to this day, English is spoken by 51% of the people in Hong Kong. And this is one of the reasons why they have these democracy protests, because a couple hundred years of British influence has imparted upon the people of Hong Kong, not just the English language, but valuing elements of democracy that other people have not experienced. And so that may, might be a good legacy of imperialism is that in Hong Kong, they receive some democratic traditions that they still are fighting and protesting for. Well, later conflict occurred again in 1856, 18. 60 in a second war. So there was a second opium war where China got beat up again. There was a second opium war. And it's the same thing. They wanted to sell more drugs and China said no. And so the Europeans said, fine, we're going to have to invade and beat you up in a second opium war. As a result, more ports were open to Europeans more ports were open to Europeans. And so this is just like this general trend where we went from like one city, Canton, to a smaller, you know, a, a larger group. And I think at the end, there was like 70 cities that the Europeans could do anything that they wanted. So open to more Europeans. Japan, France, Germany, Russia, and the United States all wanted to trade. All of them wanted to trade. And they wanted to trade at the expense of China. There's this political cartoon of China as like this slain, defeated dragon. And everyone is kind of like fighting over the body, the corpse, because there's millions of people in China. And if you can sell stuff to China, man, you can make money. I mean, there's hundreds of millions of people living there. If you can find out one thing that you can sell to them, you can make a whole bunch of money. And so here there's this famous cartoon of all these European powers fighting over the corpse of China. Each European country wanted in China their own, what we call a sphere of influence. A sphere of influence. They wanted one little section where they could take over, one little section where they would be like the ones in charge. And this political cartoon we've seen before of China being split up, kind of like a pizza pie, right? It looks like every country is like taking their little share and China is literally powerless. China can protest, but that's all they can do. They can't do anything to stop it. And even Asian country, Japan, is, is at the table. Okay, so moving away from Asia, let's now talk about economic imperialism in Africa. Before colonization, we mentioned this the other day, most African farmers grew food. Before colonization, most African farmers, they grew food. And due to European pressure, they began growing, not food, but they began growing cash crops instead. We talked about this yesterday in lecture. This provided Europeans with something that they really wanted because they had gone through the Industrial Revolution. It provided Europeans with raw materials, with raw materials. These are repeated themes that we're seeing again and again and again and again. This is what Europe got out of Africa, raw materials. And Africans did get 
some things in return that they could not make as easily or as cheaply as Europeans. One was textiles. Textiles are finished cloth product. So that's one thing that they got that they could not have gotten before. A second thing, because the British and the other Europeans are kind of encouraging Africans to stop growing food and to start uh, making cash crops, the Europeans are now bringing food in. In fact, they bring canned food in for the first time, which is something that the Europeans are again making money off the Africans. And number three, they're also bringing something else that is not good, it's destructive. This is the same thing that Europeans brought to Native Americans. They bring alcohol to the Native, uh, to the African people as well. So these are three things that they bring to Africa. And it turns out that when you take in a country and say, look, you're just going to grow cotton, you're just going to grow palm oil, you're just going to harvest rubber, and that's all you guys are going to do, turns out that's like super terrible. If you rely on a single cash crop for income, this is actually economically dangerous. This is economically dangerous. It's dangerous because what happens if the money, you know, let's say all your money's in cotton. What happens if that's all my country does is I grow cotton and next thing you know, the price of cotton drops. My, my economy is gone, right? It's economically dangerous. And most of the arable land, most of the land good for farming was now growing cash crops for export. You know, there was a change. I was using my land to feed my family, but now uh, all this land is now being used to grow a cash crop to send away, not to benefit my people directly. Food supply in Africa as a result declined. Food supply in Africa as a result declined. And this is a theme that we mentioned in a problem we talked about yesterday. Cotton was a main source of income for some places. About two countries in Africa become like huge sources of it. Egypt and Kenya, which we've talked about Egypt before. We mentioned it yesterday and we're not talking about it now. In fact, we mentioned yesterday that in Egypt, cotton accounted for a clear majority of exports. In fact, there was 93% of all the money that Egypt made was through exporting cotton. In Kenya, there's going to be another problem because in Kenya, native people are moved off the best land. They're going to be moved off the best land. You know, native people are going to be told you're actually in the way of progress. And colonial governments would give prime farmland to white settlers. You know, these white settlers are moving to Kenya and the colonial government says, listen, guess what? We've reserved the best land for you guys. White settlers. Native Africans who remained, well, what about them? What about people who have nowhere to go? Well, the great thing in the minds of these white settlers is they become a source of cheap labor. They become a source of cheap labor. They say, listen, um, you guys are going to be working these farms for these white colonists. It's not just cotton. That is a huge source of income for Europeans, but cocoa is too. In fact, cocoa becomes a major cash crop in West Africa. If East Africa is making cotton, East Af uh, West Africa is growing cocoa, which is where we get chocolate from. Slavery in Africa had been banned, outlawed by the British all the way back in 1833. We actually have mentioned that the other day in the lecture. We talked about that. Great Britain went through this like Christian evangelical time where Christians were saying, hey, you can't be Christian and support slavery. And so Christians helped change the laws that got slavery outlawed. But even though it was outlawed, it continued to be practiced in various places. Slavery was used to produce cash crops like coffee and cocoa. Coffee and cocoa. 
And sadly, there is still, even to this day, slavery that occurs as a result. All right, well, let's now turn, as we talked about Asia, we talked about Africa, let's use our last 20 minutes to talk about Latin America. So it turns out that industrial, industrialized nations look to Latin America as a source of raw materials. No surprise there. This is what Europe is looking to all non-industrial nations for. They look to Asia for this. They look to uh, Africa for this. They look to Latin America as a source of raw materials. And industrialized nations also look to Latin American middle class as potential customers. I think we talked about this yesterday too, that there are some wealthy people in Africa and in Asia and in Latin America, and they see these people as potential customers that, that not only can I get raw materials from Latin America, I can make and manufacture those into things and sell it back to them, that they can be a, a source of potential customers. And replacing Spain, you know, Spain had been like the main country, obviously, that had influenced Latin America. Replacing Spain, Latin America got a new trade partner who invested as much as $10 billion in Latin America. And that new trade partner was Great Britain. Great Britain was really influenced, uh, really interested in investing and doing business and having deals. They don't ever directly control Latin America. But indirectly, they have a lot of business influence, putting $10 billion. In fact, the British heavily invest, invested into one nation in particular. And that nation is also the country that is like the whitest nation in all of Latin America. And that's Argentina. In fact, Argentina does incredibly well in the 1800s. It's, it's kind of like the United States in that it tracks tons of Germans and Italians and it really builds up a white majority nation. Argentina does so well that its capital, Buenos Aires, is modeled after the city of Paris. And so if you ever look at pictures of Buenos Aires like we have on our handout, there's broad boulevards and broad streets. It's very reminiscent in areas of Paris. Argentina would go on to become one of the wealthiest nations in the world one of the wealthiest nations in the world at that time, at that time. And there was really a lot of comparison made between the United States and Argentina. There were white majority countries. They were, they were growing incredibly wealthy. Uh, there was a lot of comparison. If you were a white European leaving Europe in the 1900s, you, might, you were as likely in some instances to consider going to Argentina as going to the United States. There was opportunities for both places. And as a result, ethnically, uh, it is 92% white. Argentina is the whitest, and it would be the wealthiest country in the 1800s in Latin America. It still is the majority white. All right, last section in particular, Central America and the Caribbean. So powerful corporations use their home governments to act as strong men. And that's kind of an interesting term. What I mean by a strong man is that if you want something done for you, but you're not powerful to do it yourself, you ask your big brother to push someone around, you ask your big brother to bully someone for you. And that's what powerful corporations ask their home governments to be, to be strong men. They put pressure on these small nations to give favorable business conditions to give them favorable business conditions. What they wanted was they wanted to be able to farm wherever they wanted to farm. They wanted to pay whatever they wanted to pay. They wanted favorable business conditions. And if these local governments didn't want to say yes, these corporations called the United States and said, hey, would you mind putting some pressure on Guatemala? Would you mind putting some pressure on Costa Rica, whatever the case may be. And one of the most famous examples of a corporation, of a business, of a company using the United States as a strongman is a company 
that was very active in Central America called the United Fruit Company. United Fruit Company. And this United Fruit Company, we'll talk about in detail in a moment. This is an example of a corporation that used the United States government to pressure Latin America, to pressure Latin America. If a country didn't want to work with the United Fruit Company, the United Fruit Company would call up the president and say, hey, we hire a lot of Americans uh, back here. We make a lot of wealth for the United States. Can you put some pressure on these small countries so that we can do whatever we want? It says they sometimes pushed for low wages. Like that was one of the big things they wanted. They wanted to make profit. They wanted low wages. And there was a nickname that these small countries earned because of the fact that these American companies are pushing and forcing their way into these small countries. These nations earn a nickname. They become known as Banana Republic. So this nickname of a banana republic, it's because these countries were really just like doing one thing. They were growing bananas. And that's like the one thing that their country had going for them. And they were growing that because of countries like the United States kind of basically forcing them into these situations. They were small nations that depended on one product. They were small nations that depended on one product. And uh, that's not a good thing. It's not a good situation. In fact, we've talked about that the other day in lecture, that this is a situation called a monoculture, where you are just growing one thing, and a monoculture is actually economically it's dangerous. It's economically dangerous. What happens when your one product, the price goes down? What happens when the United States wants cheaper prices and they they push around your government and you don't have anything to sell but bananas? So it's economically dangerous. There's this famous poem by a Latin American author called The United Fruit Company. And this poem is actually much later in our time. I'm gonna read through it real quickly, make some quick comments, but it kind of describes like how Latin America is being pushed around by the United States and corporations and how it's almost like the end of the world and that these companies are making profits at the expense of native people. It says, when the trumpet sounded, everything was prepared on earth and Jehovah gave the world to Coca-Cola Incorporated, Anaconda, Ford Motors and other corporations. The United Fruit Company reserved for itself the most juicy piece, the central coast of my world the delicate waste of America. That's Central America, reference to that delicate waste. It rebaptized these countries banana republics, and over the sleeping dead, over the unquiet heroes who won greatness, liberty, and banners, it established an opera buffa, it abolished free wills, and gave out imperial crowns, and encouraged envy, and attracted the dictatorship of flies, and then it goes on to mention like all these last names of dictators. These were people who were willing to work with the United States, willing to say, hey, United States, I'll do whatever you want. You know, I uh, will have this relationship. These dictators were willing to sell out their own people in order to have a good relationship with the United States. It says that they were submissive. They had submissive blood and or they were willing to do whatever they want for the United States, even at the expense of their own people. Drunken flies that buzz over the tombs of the people, circus flies, wise flies, experts at tyranny. And they're flies because, you know, native people died. Local indigenous people died in these terrible conditions just so that companies would make a profit. Well, going on below that, it says, banana republics depended on dictators willing to work with the United States. They depended on dictators who were willing to work with the United States. 
And it turns out that's why this Latin American author calls them flies, this dictatorship of flies, you know, that they're willing to just do this for coffee and fruit at the expense of the destruction of the native land and the native people. These small countries, as a result, were politically unstable. What I mean by this is that they could be invaded by the United States, they could be overthrown by the United States, they could be propped up by the United States. The U.S. made friends where they wanted so they could get cheap bananas. The United States and Western powers gained political dominance. The Western powers and the United States gained political dominance. Here's a famous painting by Diego Rivera that actually addresses, outside of our time period, but it's in the same theme, of a Guatemalan coup where they actually overthrew the democratically elected Guatemalan president. And this whole thing was backed by the CIA. The CIA is our government. You know, the CIA is our central intelligence agency. And we did. We overthrew governments that we perceived were in the way of American business interests. And so this is a famous mural looking at uh, us being involved in overthrowing governments of someone who was actually duly elected because we thought, can help me get some cheap bananas out of the deal. It says, the, uh, we, the United States, gain monopolies on these countries' natural resources. And so uh, we actually overthrew governments and we did these sorts of things so we could get a cheap deal. You know, we decided that we wanted, we wanted um, to have monopolies on these countries' natural resources. We also do this in another area of the world that would become a colony or a part of the United States. A small group of American planters actually overthrew, you might remember this, the Queen of Hawaii. You might remember that uh, there was a queen in Hawaii. Uh, American planters wanted to grow fruit there, and they arrested her, threw her in jail, called up the U.S. and said, hey, we want to be part of the United States. And the United States says, we'd be happy to help you. Okay, uh, just about nine minutes left, and we'll finish up with some broad contextualizing themes. Um, in general, at this time, the Industrial Revolution led to a demand for raw materials. Raw materials. Well, we see that these factories, these British-led uh, uh, factories in the Industrial Revolution, they needed access to raw materials. And technology allowed Western nations to control non-industrial nations. So Western nations, industrialized nations, began to control non-industrial nations. And there's technology that allowed this to happen. Technology that allowed this to happen included rail and the telegraph. These are two big things that we've talked about before. The rail and the telegraph, these help uh, Western nations to control non-Western nations, rail and the telegraph. There is in the 1800s a general theme, a general shift, a power shift in favor of industrialized nations. So if you are an industrialized nation, the power shift is in your favor. China, non-industrialized, they're going down the tube, tube they're being divided up. Not uh, industrialized nations like Japan, they're on the rise, they're doing great. Farming in Africa, Asia, and Latin America shifted to a bad word. This is a word that means that you're just growing one thing, monoculture. I'm just harvesting rubber. I'm just harvesting sugar. I'm just harvesting cotton. That's a bad thing. And Western corporations use their home nations to apply pressure on developing nations. So, for example, uh, United Fruit Company uh, uses... The United States is a big brother to apply pressure to get what they want, mainly things like cheap wages, uh, by pressuring dictators, by overthrowing governments, by sometimes sending soldiers to put pressure on developing nations. Three crops and three results to think about. Number one, uh, one of the big new crops being grown at this time is opium. 
opium is one of the big uh, crops grown at this time, and it produced great wealth for one country. What country did really well as a result of opium? You should all know that's going to be Great Britain. One of the problems with opium is it addicted the people and weakened the government of. Everyone should know who got weakened and controlled by opium. It was China. A second product grown is cotton. Cotton is another huge cash crop at the time in the 1800s. And it became central to the global economy. Because guess what everyone wants? Everyone wants clothing. Everyone wants a shirt. Everyone wants cheap textiles, the global economy. There's something bad that happens with that because if I want it and I need a lot of it to be grown and produced, this increases something. It increases slavery. Um, also, it sh helped wealth shift from India. India used to be where all the wealth was, where all the money was made. It has a ship from India to a place where they can actually make it quickly and cheaply that would be a shift to great britain india still has a role their role is now they only produced raw cotton they're not making textiles anymore they're now making raw cotton alone third big cash crop at this time is palm oil we've talked about this in lecture the other day how it destroys the environment Palm oil was used for machines back in the Industrial Revolution. You need these industrial machines, you need things to keep them running smoothly. Palm oil is a great thing to use. And there's huge wealth that palm oil has for Europeans. Europeans make a lot of money out of the deal. Uh, but local people were forced to work in the fields. They're forced to work. Local people were forced to work. All three imperial, uh, for all three of these things, imperial governments build things to get them to market. They build road and rail because, you know what, I can't get palm oil or rubber or cotton or sugar or coffee. I can't get any of these things to market because there's these undeveloped roads. The British and other Europeans build road and rail to move these raw products to market. Okay, I just want to comment real quickly. There's four questions. It says that I need you to respond in complete sentences in your own unique work, which means don't randomly Google and copy and paste. Don't message your friend and say, hey, what did you put? I'm going to put one word differently and like use an adjective. Number one says in the poem, United Fruit Company, who are the flies? What happened to the natives? That's hopefully a pretty easy question, a complete sentence, two if necessary will be fine. Number two, explain one reason for the shift in agricultural influence in Asia and Latin America to industrialized states. In other words, what that question is asking you in one or two complete sentences is why is it that Asia, like India and China, were the big influencers and why did it shift to industrialized states. One, two sentences, three sentences, if you wanted to you know, just go crazy will be enough. But one really good complete sentence should be able to do it. Two is great, three if you want to go extra. Number three, explain one way in which the relationship between companies and industrialized states impacted colonized or developing states. I think we've talked about three companies you could mention. Uh, and number four, explain one way economic imperialism in the period of 1750 to 1900 contributed to native resistance. I talked to you very specifically about one example of failed native resistance. I think I even bolded it up in your notes. For all these things, a complete sentence is acceptable if it's a good one. Probably two complete sentences might be necessary. Three would be the most I would want. As long as you use evidence and an example, you can do that. So one sentence that's really well crafted could do it. Two would be fine. Uh, three would be, hey, you want a 100 and evidence and example. So with that, I'm going to stop because people were complaining that it was too long. But I made it under the hour mark. So there you go. Bye.